the U.S. is always an anomaly. Like every other like Western country has sports betting, and the U.S. only had it in Nevada. It made absolutely no sense. And today I've got Nigel Eccles, founder of FanDuel, and now the CEO of BetHog. And it seems bizarre looking back on it. It just became this massive thing that, like, suddenly, like it was being asked in presidential debates. At some point, sports betting is going to have to happen. Crypto just solves it. Amazing. It's one of the things I would say that crypto absolutely nails, which is... I'm Dan Roberts here in the FOS studio in New York, and today I've got Nigel Eccles, founder of FanDuel and now the CEO of BetHog. Nigel, thanks for joining me. No, thanks for having me. You have been such a veteran of kind of multiple spaces that, of course, interest us right mm -hmm. in our lane at FOS. Yeah. There's the sports betting stuff. There was daily fantasy yeah. sports, which kind of... Uh, made its way into the sports betting yeah. world. Now you're in crypto, yeah. which I've been saying for years that crypto and sports betting would converge and you know touch each other more and more, and now they are. I want to hear about BetHog and your mm -hmm. new ventures, but let's start with your first life, your yeah. first iteration, co-founder of FanDuel. As you look at where everything has gone, I mean, you know, PASPA was struck mm -hmm. down, which was the federal ban. Yep. That allowed states to legalize sports betting, and then it was off to the races yeah, for companies yeah. like DraftKings and FanDuel, yeah. which still have fantasy businesses, yeah, yeah, but yeah. quickly totally. embrace sports betting. Yeah. When you look at the landscape now, especially with DraftKings and FanDuel, which once were sort of the challengers nosing their way yeah. in, and now they're the big dogs, yeah. what do you make of where uh, the landscape stands? Yeah, well, it's been quite an incredible journey. Um, I will say that one of the things that I think we felt like prior to PASPA repeal and has actually turned out to be true was if we invest now when other people are not investing in this market, um, if like US is always an anomaly, like every other like Western country has sports betting, right? And the US only had it in Nevada. It made absolutely no sense. And it, like we always sort of, no one could predict how or when it would happen, but you always sort of think, well, ultimately it must happen, right? So we were like, took the view that like we're, DFS is a good business. We're gonna invest, we're gonna build a product and a user base and a brand. At some point, sports betting is gonna have to happen. And if that does, then we're in a great position. And that was just kind of our view. Now we didn't spend all day planning for it because you know, we didn't, you know, we didn't, um, we didn't exactly nudge the Supreme Court. <laughs> you know, like we there's no one has that influence there. But we sort of were like, look, we want to build this really, you know, this business, or if this, that happens, that's going to be all upside. And so that absolutely paid off in spades. And, and I think the other interesting thing was that a lot of people said at the time, and immediately, even afterwards, 2018, 2019, even 2020, people were saying, well, the casinos are just getting started. You know, the casinos like Caesars, once they get into this market, they're going to blow these little upstarts away. And I, I never thought that to be the case. I always thought that I always thought the casino business was a very different business from uh, online sports betting. I, I it, you know, cause to me, casinos is much more like the hotel business, whereas online sports betting is more like the video game business. Mm -hmm. Like you're managing developers, you've got release cycles. The businesses are actually couldn't be any more different. They both involve betting, but they're just very different. And so when I looked at it in 2018, when PASPA happened, I was like, okay, here we have these companies that have great brands, user base, but actually have a team that are totally focused on acquiring users online and monetizing them. And here we have these people who build amazing cathedrals in the desert. Who am I going to bet on? And, and I was like, we bet on the first one, right? Like, it, and and that that's sort of what paid off. Wow. And of course, during that time before Passport was repealed, you guys kind of had to walk this delicate dance mm -hmm. of, well, we're a daily fantasy yeah. sports company but you had AGs in various yeah. states, most notably in New York, yeah. saying, well, actually, your fantasy games are themselves a form of betting. You're yes. doing illegal betting operations. Yeah, yeah. And you had to sort of battle those in court while yeah. also knowing that soon enough it'll all be moot if it mm -hmm. really is legalized state by state. Yeah. And, of course, now, in hindsight, vindicated that yeah. this would happen. But, you know, how brutal was that period of time oh, where yeah, it was, that was courtroom battles? That was wild. Like, you know, the, sort of the background is... Um, you know, fantasy sports has been legal in the U.S. like forever. It's been considered a game of skill. Um, every state has kind of slightly different laws, but in the states we operated in, it was generally skill predominant. Like, what's more important is it is a chance or skill? And and we felt, and we had good data to show that fantasy. And if you play in fantasy league, and you've won, you're 100% convinced it's a game of skill. Now, if you lose, you might be like, oh, I think it was a lot of chance that year. But, you know, like generally what we could show was skill was a predominant factor. Um, and so there wasn't any regulator you could go to and say, please bless us. You had to just go with it. And that's what we did. And in 2015, 
And it seems bizarre looking back on it. It just became this massive thing that like suddenly like it was being asked in presidential debates like every week we're having AGs like putting their opinion um, and like their opinions were like you know a couple of pieces of paper like in my opinion it's it's a game of chance right, right? like and there was no real analysis to it and so we were facing this sort of existential crisis which are like oh my god we're going to get shut down we're not even going to get to court because they're going to just kill us before we even get there ironically enough the only time it's really gone to court has been in New York, where it uh, went all the way up to the Court of Appeals, and the Court of Appeals found it was a game of skill. So we were right, but that was long after, I think that was like 2022, right. long after like 2015. Like, Which is how we, things go in the courts. It's how they, yeah, it no, takes so long, it takes we've already so long, moved on. Everyone's moved on, like what, what are we even discussing this? So it's, it's, it's really fascinating. That time was hellish. But, you know, I'd say the great thing was that, like, we had to take that risk. It proved to be the right bet. And, you know, that's why the companies are where they are today, because, you know, you know we're, we were willing and, you know, everyone was willing to take that risk early on to be in that position that in 2018, you know, we had such a head start. I always thought the distinction was kind of silly because everyone would frame it as one or the other. Mm. You know, our fantasy sports games, games of skill or yeah. chance. Yeah. Well, it's both. It takes yeah. both. You know, yeah. you're right. Of course, when you have a friend who has repeatedly won, it means yes. that they're good at this yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. But also, you are quite literally selecting a roster of real-life human players. Yeah. You have no, you have no idea control. how they'll play. Yeah, exactly. You don't control them, and then one of them gets injured. So yeah. there's a, certainly a yeah. lot of chance involved. Yeah. yeah. I think there was some... Like, some heat was coming to us. We were saying we were a game of skill. And I think some people interpreted it as saying, we don't think we should be regulated. We should be able to do whatever the hell we like. Right. And I think we tried to, and that was one of the reasons we went out and get laws, like sensible laws passed, we changed laws in 22 states. Because it was us saying, look, we're saying this is a game of skill, but we're not saying don't regulate us. We're saying, like, regulate us. You know, we don't want bad things happening in this industry. And so I think that helped a lot. Um, and But it was... Looking back today, it's like, wow, why did everyone get so cross so quickly about this thing? Yeah, um, it, it, it was quite why. bizarre. <laughs> there were too many TV ads. Yeah, too many. Maybe that's it was, maybe it was so yeah, suddenly, yeah. <laughs> Although compared to today, it, it was a drop in the bucket. Uh, that's absolutely right. I mean, let, let's stick on this for a while mm -hmm. because I, I covered this time very closely. The 2015 to 2017, there was just this DFS explosion. Yeah. Was it betting and politicians kind of, in some ways, I think, using those companies to make a name for themselves yes. and go yeah, after absolutely. them. Absolutely. Um, now, when you look at it, talk about the DraftKings versus FanDuel head-to-head mm -hmm. -head competition. Yeah. What was always interesting to me that I think people didn't realize at the time, there was a period of years where DraftKings seemingly kind of came out of nowhere. FanDuel mm. actually came first, yeah, yeah. and FanDuel originated outside the U.S. Yeah. DraftKings was this very Boston company, yeah. and I think did a lot right on the brand and mm -hmm. marketing side. Yeah. Spent enormous money yeah, yeah, for yeah. TV ads and radio ads and promo codes, and for a while kind of overtook FanDuel. Yeah. Now, you know, years later, the dust has settled, you look at the market share, and FanDuel yeah. is the, the bigger market player. Yeah, it's a really interesting story, because, yes, yeah, so FanDuel started in 2009, DraftKings started in 2012. Even before DraftKings, there was other competitors, like Draft Street was a very notable competitor of ours in the really early days. Um, the interesting thing was, like, FanDuel, um, in the early days, we, we actually got quite close to profitability in, like, 2012, that sort of era. What DraftKings sort of said is, okay, we're late to the party. We're going to do two things. Number one, well, there are three things. One, they built a really good product, very competitive mm -hmm. in certain areas, better than FanDuel. But number two was, we're going to run at a loss, like a really heavy loss. Like we're actually going to, we're going to run tournaments where we'll give away a million dollars in prizes and we'll only take $800 in entry fees. Well, you know, why would you do that? I said, well, because all of you're a top player that's where you're going to go and play. And that was very, very effective. And we thought it was, you know, we thought it was crazy. We understood why they were doing it, but it was very effective. And number three was, they were like, we're going to spend you 2X, you know, or 3X. We're just going to raise more money. We've got the same product. We're going to steal your top players. And it, it worked, right? And um, the one thing that FanDuel always retained, and then this is why this is interesting, is that FanDuel always retained a, a focus on efficiency and say, okay, they're going to outspend us, right? but we're gonna continue to be disciplined and only like only do deals that make sense. We're gonna be really cost efficient on how we acquire customers. And what that meant was even though DraftKings was outspending us, we were kind of holding our own. Ultimately, the weight of money that DraftKings spent meant that they pulled ahead in DFS. But this is where it gets interesting today. That culture still like, lives there in FanDuel today. And I think it still kind of lives a little bit in DraftKings. They're kind of like spend to make it kind of thing. Whereas 
FanDuel had a much more disciplined culture. And what that meant was when both companies had the same amount of money, I think they last year approximately spent the same amount of money on acquisition, FanDuel acquired more customers. Because mm. they still had that culture of like, no, we're only going to do deals that make sense. Whereas I think DraftKings has still got a bit of a culture, certainly historically had up until very recently, of get big at all costs. And so that's the interesting yeah. thing. When you level the sort of playing field and the amount you spend, FanDuel then sort of takes the sort of the podium position, as it were. Yeah, yeah. And of course, uh, bears mentioning that the split, in my mind, in terms of the futures of these companies, came when one went public mm -hmm. via SPAC, DraftKings yeah, became a, yeah. publicly a publicly traded company, and FanDuel sold to yeah. Patty Power Betfair, yeah, yeah. which of course, you know, through a number of different uh, convolutions is now flutter right, yes. in the U.S. Yeah. And uh, worth mentioning, I know there's only so mm -hmm. much you can talk about this, yeah. you are in fact involved in a pretty big years mm -hmm. running lawsuit mm -hmm. against the original board members right. dating back to the time of that 2018 sale. That's correct. So what can you tell us a little bit about you know, what is the reasoning behind this lawsuit and, and mm -hmm. where things stand? Yeah, so, uh, you know, very simply, um, I, I, you know, give you the broad and then I, I, can, I, I can tell you where you go if you want to know more. So essentially what happened in 2018 was um, FanDuel uh, was merged with, uh, we'll call it Flutter International. At the time it was called Bedford Paddy Par and they had a U.S. division. Um, it was roughly equivalent size to Flutter or to FanDuel. And so they merged those two entities. It was a paper for paper transaction. So no one got cash. Everyone got paper in this new entity. And so suddenly the former FanDuel shareholders um, were uh, now owned 40% of this new company, which was called FanDuel Group, which had FanDuel uh, and Flutter's US entity plus a bunch of money. Um, so whenever you do something like that, uh, you have to put a value. And what is, what's the value of those shares? Um, and so, uh, and the reason that really mattered was the way FanDuel was structured was we had something which is called a preference stack, which means the first $559 million on an exit would go to the, the, the investors. And then after that, the, the founders, the employees, the early oh, investors geez. would share. Yeah, we would share the upside with them. That was the structure. Um, and so normally in a transaction like that, you would either preserve the structure like say, okay, um, you know, the, the, we have this structure. We don't need to. We don't need to set a valuation because we're going to pre preserve the structure. When we ultimately exit, we will then everyone will get paid out. They could have done that. The alternative one you would do is you'd say, okay, let's find out what the value of forty percent is today, mm. right? They took the third option, which is they said, why don't we just make up a number? And they made that to be five hundred fifty-nine million. Lo and behold, uh, lo and behold, it just happened to match that. And therefore, all of the upside went to the, the board members who were preference shareholders. So that that's basically was the case. Uh, we filed suit that summer, even before the, 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 uh, the deal had closed. Um, and we are currently in New York court. Um, and we very recently, three months ago, had a very favorable ruling from the Court of Appeals. Which will allow it to continue. Which, yeah, but Allows basically- the to be refiled. Well, basically what that did was it that said that, um, that the uh, board members have a fiduciary duty to shareholders. It basically says that the board members have to act in the interests of the shareholders. They, they can't just like say, no, we're just gonna grab this for ourselves. They can't act in their own interests of fiduciary duty. Um, we filed an extended complaint uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, that's public. It's got 200 odd pages with, you know, with all documents from it. Um, and if you're really more interested in that, that's where you go. <laughs> that's everything. Looking back on all that, here's a question for you, not specific to the mm -hmm. lawsuit. Do you regret selling the company in that way? Uh, so I did had no part in the sale. Well, so as, a, I, as a co-founder of the business. So I think one of the things, and I, and I was very public at the time, and I've been public since, is I actually think the merger was was really good. Um, the, the the merger with uh, Flutter Entertainment US, because I think that really helped to solidify their position and put them to be number one. Um, what and I obviously it has unquestionably worked when you look at it. It unquestionably worked. Yeah. And we, we've, never, we've never sort of said, oh, this was terrible. They should have done something else. We said, no, this was a, a great deal. What they should have done and done it properly. And, you know, and, and if they'd done it properly, we wouldn't be in this situation today. Yep. Given people what they believed they were owed equity wise. And not, not believe, like, they just, you know, what they, you know, what they were. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about crypto. Yeah. You know, sure. even as we monitor all this stuff, you're still in the, the, 
the betting, uh, watching world, mm -hmm. which is fun. Uh, now you are a crypto guy, fair yep, to yep. say? I mean, yep. first of all, when did you kind of catch the crypto bug? Blood, because, uh, you know, personally, I always, as a sports business journalist, was also fascinated mm -hmm. by crypto. And I felt like the ways in which they would converge were obvious. Yeah. And we still haven't fully seen yeah. it, but we're starting to see it more and more. Yeah, so I think the first time I looked at it was 2017, uh, which was like a, a little bit of a crypto bubble, uh, like yep. small compared yep. to the one Before today. Before twenty twenty one. At yeah. the time, like Ethereum blew up and there was all these other tokens. And I remember going through every token in the top 100 coin market cap and I looked through it and I just desperately wanted to understand them all. And I remember just going through them and going, okay, like Bitcoin, I get it, I get what it, in Ethereum, right, the world computer, that seems amazing, it's incredible, decentralized computer, very exciting. And they started going through all the other ones and I'm like, yeah, that sounds like that one. Like this one sounds like a scam. This one doesn't make any sense. Like you don't the, say, you know, and you kind of go through it and you're like, oh boy. And then and then Crypto Kitties came out and I'm like, they're really cool. I want to buy a Crypto Kitty. That seems like uh, the idea that I could own this thing. And then just finding the, you know, the experience of buying it just so difficult and so challenging. I was like, wow, this is. And as an entrepreneur, I just love building consumer products. You know, I'm like, oh, build a consumer product. I'm like, yeah, let's do it. If you're like, hey, do you want to build some infrastructure, you know, that you know somebody might use, and I'm like, that's not for me. So in 2017, I dabbled with it, and I'm like, this is not ready for consumers. Like, I, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm out of here. And then in 2020, um, I actually two products that really caught my eye. One was uh, NBA Top Shot, which yeah. I'm sure you know well, and the other was Nifty Gateway. Mm -hmm. And both of those, I just thought were. I already had launched a business in the sports card space, so I really got, I really loved NFTs from day one. I'm like, I get it, I get it immediately. It's like a sports card, but it's virtual. Um, and so I, I really got into those two products and I loved the idea of collecting digital art. And so that just, and then I just fell into it. And then from that moment onwards, I was like, I'm crypto for life. I would say today, in looking back like four years later, I'm definitely surprised we've not made more progress, right? Like yeah, I, I was just about to say, it's yeah. still not consumer ready. It's still arguably. not consumer ready. No, it's like, and I think it's one of the challenges I think we've found, and I, as an entrepreneur in crypto, that I find is, um, whenever we extract away the crypto, right, and we go, hey, you can, you know, you can do all the this cool, fun stuff. In a lot of ways, you hide all the benefits, right? Mm. You're saying to somebody you own this and you're like, I don't really care, I own it, it's just like an app and I bought this thing. I don't own it, if the app goes away, then it's gone. And so that's the sort of, so we've seen applications and I built them that abstract away the crypto and the normies don't get it. They're just like, I don't, like, why would you? And then- And, and the crypto people don't like it as and much the they don't want to abstract away. I don't want to extract away, I right. want to like interact directly with the chain. Or you can build products, and it's been a better strategy, build them for crypto degens. Um, because they can get it and they can get excited about it. The problem is that then you don't get the, the mass market. Right. Like, because onboarding them is like, well, how do, how do I buy this? And like, well, what do you gotta do is you gotta go to Coinbase and you gotta go and you know, buy mm -hmm. some money and then you'll, you know, then you again, you transfer it to a wallet and then they'll give you a seed phrase that you cannot ever forget. Because if you do, it's gone and you just, and then they're, and it's just like gobbledygook. Yep. You and, lose and a lot of people. You lose so many and the conversion's horrible. And so you were kind of stuck between these two stools. It's like, do I build for a crypto native, in which case the mass market is never going to want to do it, um, or do I build for normies, in which case the, you know, he won't get it. <laughs> and and so that's been a really big challenge in the industry. Um, still, like I still am like, where's your AAA games? Because I could still see the benefits of, and so I'm still a little perturbed, but I'm not. Like as an entrepreneur, I'm like, no, it just means that there's still opportunities out there that we haven't tackled. I still, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm totally convinced. I just don't really have a timeline on it. But and that brings up Bedhog. Yeah. This business you're now mm -hmm. working on. Yeah. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So one of the interesting things in, um, in all forms of gaming, uh, all onshore and offshore, is one of your biggest issues is payments, right? So you're like, okay, I've got an amazing product, I can get marketing, I can get people to it, and they turn up, and how do they get money onto the product? Even FanDuel, which is regulated onshore, got all the best banking relationships, spends an enormous amount of money on payments. The, you're getting your money in and out of FanDuel. Very, very expensive for them. And offshore is even worse, right? Like It's like, you know, I'm trying to get money in and out of, um, I don't know, somewhere in Eastern Europe or, you know, uh, any of these markets, like somewhere in Latin America, 
it's incredibly expensive um, and sometimes even impossible. Like I can get the customer to the site, they want to play, they want to place a bet, but there's no way to get the money in mm. and out. Um, crypto just solves that, like amazing. It's one of the things I would say that crypto absolutely nails, which is payments. And so um, BetHog is a crypto casino and sports book. Um, there are other real great examples. Stake.com was a great one. Uh, they did about three billion in revenue last year. So they're big. They only started in 2017. Um, and they basically figured out, it's like, oh wow, if we want to do like a global casino and sports book, let's use crypto. Like let's focus on crypto. Um, what we want to do with BetHog is we want to lean e even more into crypto. Because Stake takes crypto, but it doesn't, it doesn't lean into crypto culture. Mm. And what we want to do with Bad Hog is to create much more of a crypto native casino and sports book that builds products that are much more for that demographic. And so what's that demographic? Well, crypto, and I know this well, like the crypto holders are typically young, male, competitive. We know this demographic, right? Probably R falls pretty well in the sports betting. Exactly. You know, very, yep. very nice crossover with daily fantasy sports. And they're, you know, they're competitive. They want to play, and one of the interesting things is they typically don't want to play casino products. Like they don't want to go in and play a product that you know is negative EV, use a poker term, i.e. for every dollar they bet, they're going to win 95 cents or 97%. Yep. They want to play a game like DFS or like poker or other games where they actually, their skill means that they actually could win in the long run. And so some of the games we're building at BetHog are exactly like that. That's like, hey, you know, we're, you know, we obviously have casino products, but we're also building a number of products where they can compete with other players. So it leans in much more to the demographic that you know that that, that holds crypto today. Wow, if we if we tie it all together, Nigel, to wrap up, you know, I I have seen in some ways I think I, there's there's shades here and there that don't fit the the take, but. Uh, fantasy and sports betting mm -hmm. and crypto, and of course I could also mention cannabis has gone the same mm -hmm. way, uh, as industries that have followed the same path legally in terms of regulation. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. it was a, a, a mess for a while, and yeah. it's state by state in terms yeah. of the legality, and things are starting to settle and become clear, but it's still very inconsistent. Yeah. I mean, there are states where sports betting isn't legal, there are yeah. states where only one type is legal, yeah. and similarly with crypto, it's been all about facing oh. angry regulators, yeah. state by state, or businesses have to say, we only operate outside the US, yeah. even though they're US brands, everyone yes. works at the companies in the US, yeah. you know, come on, it's yeah, like yeah. A, a wink and a nudge. So as you look at the next 5, 10, 15 mm -hmm. years out yeah. for crypto and sports betting, which is now yeah. your lane, do you see all that improving? Do you see the regulation uh -huh. becoming much clearer? Absolutely. The, you know, the parallels between crypto today and where DFS was in 2013, 14, 15 are incredible. Like it's, this is a space where big operators can't go, right? Like they're, you know, like they, they you know, we've seen DraftKings did with Rainmakers. I thought it was a really cool product. Ultimately, they just had to say like, we just can't, like we're just have to go to get out of this and pay the settlement and, and, and get out of here. Um, even Facebook, with all of their resources, and I, you know, I, I thought Libra was a really interesting project. They were like, "We we got to do something else. We just cannot do this." Crypto is in that space today, where you know, as an entrepreneur, and that's a, that's where I space where I want to be. Whereas I can do something. It's not about having the most money. It's about having really good ideas. About you know, being willing to like test things and take some of that risk on. Ultimately myself and crypto, we all, we're ultimately regulation embracing. Like we want sensible regulations. I think, you know, what, what I, what we wanted in DFS was we didn't want no regulations. We just wanted sensible regulations where we could build a really cool product that people would love and that, you know, we, we would survive, not be, you know, and, uh, and so, and I, it's exactly the same with crypto is, and I think we get there over time, which is like crypto is here to stay. It is growing. It's growing faster than the internet grew at, at a similar period. People love this idea of real ownership, of not having to trust third parties. There's huge benefits here. Everyone like, that I work with at crypto, they want all of that, and they want the scams out. They want the bad actors out. And the only way we get there is through like sensible regulation. It's going to take time. It's going to be bumpy. There's going to be like lots of like, you know, like we had with, you know, Schneiderman in 2015. You know, there's going to be like politicians who want to make a name for themselves through like, trying to like, we're going to shut this down. Yep. But 
I, I'm, an, I'm a total optimist on this, and that I, I think what we've seen, we've seen with DFS is that you know we work, we changed the law in 22 states, you know, and, and everyone won. Like the players got to play, the companies got to exist, and the you know the, the government got tax revenue. So like it's kind of a win-win. I think it's going to be the same in crypto, which is people love this technology. I think that you know, with reg proper regulation, what happens is people can get to use it and continue, like the U.S. can continue to lead on it, and ultimately the government's going to find a way to tax it. So, right. like, it's right. like, you know, and we push out the bad actors. So the problem at the moment is we're in this legal limbo where we have lots of the bad actors in, and there's no kind of cop because, the, you know, the you know, regulation's all over the place. And so, I, but I'm an optimist. I think we get there. Nice. I love the optimism. Yeah. I'm not necessarily convinced everyone in crypto actually wants regulation. Yeah, you know? maybe not I everybody. Think they hope the regulation everyone will just I go deal away. Deal with. Uh, yeah. But, I, uh, yes. Sometimes when I go into those meetings, and there's some people are like, and that was true in DFS as well. Like I remember, right. like people were like, we don't want government, yeah. and we, we don't just want leave it. us alone. And and, and I was luck. like, that's not the way this works. <laughs> like yeah. ultimately, you know, we're, we're in a society. We have to come in. You know, and. And either we can do it the easy way or we can do it the hard way. Let's try and find an easy way that works for all the parties. And so, no, there's a lot of, there is a, yeah, I would say there's a very, very strong libertarian bent within crypto. But I think anyone who really wants to build like a big business and something that might even outlive them, they recognize that the current status quo does not persist. They we're not gonna, we're not all gonna move to see stead out in an island. We don't have to worry about laws. Or we can create our own laws. Like we, they kind of recognize you. You right. gotta, you know. It's funny. Even the people and and uh, you saw the Peter Thiel interview. He said everyone complains about California, but funnily enough, they all stay. <laughs> right. right. So like that's you know, I mean, yep. complain about regulation here. You're like, look, you complain about it, but you either help shape it. You know, or you leave, and it looks like not very many people are leaving. <laughs> yep, yep. Nigel, great conversation. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah, you too. Cool. All right. Wow, it's that's great, man. Great fun. It's it's funny, you know. Back when I was covering that stuff, um, I had multiple people being like, "You should do a book. You should do a book on it." I was like, "I don't know. It's all still happening."